While the supply siders were off rejecting Keynesian economics, the so-called saltwater economists, working at universities mostly along the eastern and western coastline, were working to save the Keynesian view from the devastating critique of Robert Lucas and rational expectations. Contrary to the assertions of the new classical economists, the Keynesian framework had an explanation for the energy crisis and stagflation of the 1970s. Where real business cycle theorists were claiming that these recessions amounted to little more than extended and voluntary vacations on the part of workers, the new Keynesians noted that a sharp rise in the price of oil would cause a leftward shift in short-run aggregate supply, pushing up the price level and pushing down real GDP. While this did defy the claim of the standard Phillips curve, that there is a short-run trade-off between inflation and unemployment, because here you had more inflation and more unemployment, it wasn't in opposition to the overall theory. But the new Keynesian school of thought was indeed new. The rational expectations hypothesis, along with the Lucas critique, needed a response, and it wasn't going to be found in the orthodox Keynesian framework. But like Keynes, the new Keynesian school rooted their view of the business cycle in empirical reality. The general public, to some degree, did fall for the money illusion, and imperfect competition, along with bounded rationality, rather than the assumption of total rationality found in the real business cycle theory, meant that there were price rigidities, or sticky prices. The new Keynesian economists embarked on a quest to find rigorous and convincing reasons for wage and price stickiness, because as soon as you have that stickiness, then you have a short run and a long run where changes in aggregate demand will have real effects on the economy. An explosion of new research was quick to identify rational reasons that prices and wages would be sticky enough that markets would not clear. One was menu costs, named for the example that best illuminated it. When there are changes in the price level, inflation or deflation, then restaurants have to reprint their menus with new prices. That is a real cost and one which might not be worth it if the price changes are small enough or if the rate of inflation is changing prices too rapidly. Of course, this applies to more than just restaurants. Adapting to new prices involves costly actions and avoidance of those costs will be like friction preventing prices and wages from changing quickly. A second was shoe leather costs, again named for the example given for it. Inflation is like a tax on people who are holding cash. It erodes the purchasing power of your money and you could afford less than you were able to afford before. To guard themselves against inflation, people will try to store their cash in accounts which pay interest in excess of inflation and only keep just what cash they need for a short period of time. That means they will need to make more trips to the bank to withdraw small amounts of cash, wearing out their shoes and forcing them to buy new pairs of shoes more frequently. Okay, I know this example is a little outdated. Back in the 80s, people used to go to the bank a lot more and pay for things with cash. Today, the economy is a bit different, but the problem is still real. Protecting your assets from inflation can involve real costs that prevent people from doing it. The truth is, most people don't do anything to protect their money from inflation because there are a lot of barriers in the way. And that's the point. We all face friction, which slows us or stops us from behaving perfectly rationally. A third major reason why prices and wages would be sticky are implicit and explicit contracts. I sometimes think about professional athletes for this. When a baseball player signs a 10-year contract with a team, their salary is locked in. No matter what inflation is over those 10 years, their salary won't be adjusted for it. And of course, lots of people sign contracts like this with their employer. Even if it's just for one year, that's a year where your wages are locked in. 
if the economy experiences some unexpected inflation. You won't be able to adjust your pay until the contract expires and you can renegotiate. And even in circumstances where there isn't an explicit contract you and your employer are signing, there is a social understanding about how things work. Most employers have HR departments that give each employee an annual review, which is followed by a raise that incorporates any cost of living adjustments due to inflation. Real business cycle theory is assuming these reviews and adjustments are happening, happening continuously, but that just isn't the reality we live in. In many ways, this is the whole ball game. If you can show that there are significant frictions in the economy which slow adjustments to changes in the price level down, then management of that price level through aggregate demand will impact production and employment. The new Keynesians could have just as easily been called the new monetarists, however. The work of Milton Friedman and Anna Schwartz made clear that it was monetary shocks not animal spirits in the paradox of thrift that was causing economic downturns. Monetary policy, and not fiscal policy, was the primary tool for those who wanted to keep the economy stable. And central still were the role of expectations. The hope of a stable Phillips curve that enticed the neoclassical synthesis was dead and the new Keynesians recognized that permanent deviations from the natural rate of unemployment would require ever accelerating rates of inflation, which would do more harm than good. And while the freshwater economists were whispering in the ears of the president and Congress, the saltwater economists were steering the Federal Reserve.